Great. I'm very excited to talk about mirrors and diversion structures. We're going to be talking about them for two reasons. One is they are used as a flow measurement tool in open channel flow. Weirs create controlled hydraulic conditions that allow us to relate a very simple measurement, which is water depth or water elevation, surface water elevation, also known as stage, so the stage of the water, to flow rate. It's very hard to measure discharge in open channels. You've got to put that velocity meter in there. There's a lot of different tools to do it. And we do do it. We do it on rivers all the time for USGS gauges, which relate water stage to discharge in a natural river channel. Um, so folks go out there and they'll take a velocity probe and do cross sections or they have acoustic um, devices, Doppler devices on boats, um, but it's a lot of processing, it's a lot of work. So when we do have the ability to create a controlled hydraulic conditions that continuously measure flow rate pretty accurately based on stage, we do that with, um, with weirs. But what we see here, of course, is not to measure discharge, but to divert discharge or flow. And so that's the other aspect of weirs that we talk about is they're designed to elevate water so that we can divert it into a canal, a tunnel, or somewhere else. And this is, you've seen this in the Bat Canyon, this diverts water into the government Highline Canal, which brings water all across the north edge of the valley and irrigates pretty much the entire valley on the northern side, all the way to Mac. So for our learning objectives, we're gonna use the conservation of energy equation to derive the quote, ideal Weir equation. And that's one that's based on no energy losses, but then we'll throw in the Weir coefficient, which we'll talk about, which accounts for energy loss. We'll describe various kinds of weirs and weir equations, not weird equations, weir equations. And then we'll apply these equations to design weirs and also estimate discharge. Great, so first we're gonna watch a short video on this. I'm gonna pause the recording and we'll have a link to this video in the in canvas. In the Grand Valley, we have a lot of years, which in some cases could be just considered low head dams or uh, any structure that spans the channel. This is the diversion up in um, Redlands Power Canal. It's an OG weir on the Gunnison River before it comes into the Colorado River here in town. And Grady referenced this in the video, but these weirs can be very dangerous because they create hydraulic conditions downstream that can entrap boaters and swimmers. This is essentially a roller that can keep you from being able to swim out, can entrap you. So um, when we don't, when we have low head dams that have been installed in the past, they're no longer in use, oftentimes people are trying to get, get them out of the river. Not only are they a hazard for swimmers and they can kill people, but they also block fish passage. So fish, I think in this particular case, there's a fish ladder and screen that allows fish to pass through the structure, but without that, fish aren't able to swim up, upstream. And so we have native species that go up and down the river, uh, come back shove and the like, and without retrofitting this structure, they're not able to pass it. But we actually do have a program that retrofitted the structure. So we'll start to define some terms for weirs. We're gonna introduce it conceptually with these slides, and then we will start to learn about how to derive the weir equation and use it. So the first set of terms we'll learn about weirs are contracted and uncontracted. And you can see that uncontracted, if this is our channel cross-section here in the hash lines, then uncontracted just means we don't force the water to contract, to move through the weir. So this just spans the channel. And if we look at this particular weir, you could say this is probably an uncontracted weir where it goes all the way across the channel and we're not pushing water in. 
It might not actually be the case, but it kind of looks that way. So contracted forces the water into a smaller cross-sectional area. And there are different, there's basically a different equation or approach, different parameters to consider there. Lots of different shapes. Rectangle is gonna be the most standard. We've got triangles, trapezoids, and all these are gonna have different relationships between the depth of water and the flow rate going through. The triangle, because it's got steep um, edges, allows you to have probably one of the more sensitive measurement ranges because for a given increase in discharge, you get a lot bigger increase in, in elevation or depth of water flowing through that compared to something like this. So in your book, we have these figures and there's a lot of parameters that, that can go into designing a weir. Um, this just came right out of your book. And what it's talking about is we've got the height of the water over the weir. And of course that's gonna range depending on the discharge. Um, and then we've got these different um, basically ratios that we need to design this contracted weir. And if we keep, if we design the weir in a way that meets these, these criteria, meaning the width is greater than three times the flow depth, the side width is greater than three times the flow depth, and then the, the distance from the channel bottom up to the bottom of this weir is greater than six times the flow depth then the USBR standard equations apply. So they've created these equations for weirs and you can use them if your weir um, has been designed to meet these criteria. Same for the triangular. If it's not, if it's a non-standard weir, then you have to calibrate it and evaluate your own weir coefficient. You've got trapezoidal weirs, called Cipolletti, they've got their own equation. And then we also have flumes. We're not gonna talk about flumes. It's a whole other lecture that we could do that we're not gonna do. Flumes are very common, probably the most common flow measurement device in Colorado. And here's a picture of partial flume. It's the official flume of Colorado. I don't know if you knew we had an official flume in Colorado. But if you're gonna install a flume because you have to measure the water you're diverting from a river, from the various you know, water rights regulations that we have, then you're probably gonna be on the hook to put a partial flume in. And this, yeah, I took this picture. It's on the Mesa, um, past Water Dog Reservoir. So there's just a random ditch in the middle of a field and they put a flume in there. Um, in Colorado, you're not required to actually record flow rate over time, but you have to have a flume there so someone can walk up to it and look at it and be like, well, yep, you're diverting 1.2 CFS and that's what your water right says and you're good. Yeah. Soon. Official bird, tree and flume. Um, so for example, on the Yampa River, when Flow rates go really low in the summer when they've, they've been doing that. Um, people can have a water call. Call means that, hey, um, if you have a junior water right, you gotta shut off your diversion because there's not enough water for everyone. Everything's hunky-dory until things get bad. So if someone can make a call, and then that's when the various kind of water commissioners will come out and they'll look at everyone's diversions and that like, you're only allowed to divert 7.2 CFS and you have to have a flume installed. Back in the day, no one had flumes because it was all just kind of, um, you know, what's the word I'm thinking of? Everyone just kind of worked it out, right? But now it's now we've got a lot less water in the river, especially in the, in the summertime. So you gotta have a flume, gotta be able to prove that what you're diverting is what you're diverting. Otherwise you could get shut down. So here's Mr. Partial. Professor Hydraulics Engineer at Colorado State University. And he is testing a partial flume on a ditch out in Fort Collins. He used a slide rule, I'm sure. So I just had to throw a picture of a slide rule in there back in the day. I don't know how to use a slide rule, so I'm not gonna bust anyone's chops about it. This is how they work. They 
contract the flow. They have a, a slope that will create a critical flow conditions, and then you get a hydraulic jump. And you can measure at different points, but the idea is if you measure the flow here, um, you should be able to, if the partial flume is designed a certain way with the ratios of um, entrance width to throat width, this is the throat right here, and then the slopes and all that. If you design it accordingly, then uh, Mr. Partial and others came up with a bunch of tables and coefficients and stuff. So you can directly calculate flow rate based on just the elevation of the flow. So people will put these little tapes on them and I have one in my office. You've probably seen it. it's just a little measuring tape that you would stick on the inside of a flume. And you can directly translate the depth of the flow to your flow rate. These are gonna be a little easier to install because they don't require, you know, they don't require the water to back up to pour over, which is what these weirs do. These can work in kind of smaller creeks that are a little steeper, but they require basically a pool above them. And that's really hard to create in a natural creek because water really likes to kind of go around and under. So flumes, you don't elevate the water necessarily too much. And so they're a little bit easier to install, but sometimes they're kind of permanent things like this one where it's an engineer had to design it in concrete and all this stuff. So if you design your partial flume and you get all the ratios correct, you can actually buy these you know, online. There's a couple of manufacturers, maybe two in the country that make them. Then you've got this nice relationship here. So the points are the measurements of flow rate and stage. So stage on the x-axis flow rate and, I'm sorry, on the uh, stage on the y-axis flow rate on the x-axis. And this is log log paper. And they've got a nice, pretty, pretty tight line there, right? And so here's your equation. And you can just um, calculate your discharge. We actually had one built. This is a modified partial flume. And this is up on the Mesa. I actually need to take it out because we're done with the study. But I'll wait till the snow melts. And we put it in to measure flow rates. Um, this is a little installation here to capture the flow. It's really hard to put these in. It's hard to kind of keep all the flow from going under and circumventing it. All right, let's stop there.